Hello, everybody. I've just started recording. Hello, James. Hello, Joe. Um, I'm about to get started. Uh, and, How's it going? Um, this today is meant to be uh, fun. It's not that serious completely. Hopefully, it'll be a little bit amusing. Um, I would invite everybody to interrupt me when I'm talking here. This is not a super serious talk, and I'm happy to... Um, have a little clever repartee. Uh, you get extra points if you can make people laugh in character. Okay, so let me see. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, thanks everybody. So um, my talk today is the Gadgeteer superhero trope made real, a lighthearted look at the future. So the Gadgeteer is a classic superhero type. Um, the canonical example is MacGyver from the TV show, but also Iron Man, uh, who has no superpowers except for being smart. Um, and he made himself an exoskeleton, which gives him superpowers. In some incarnation, Batman uh, is also a Gadgeteer. Uh, sometimes he relies on little machines and... Uh, bat copters and uh, bat batarangs and other little things that he makes. But he's also a martial artist. Uh, my favorite villain is Dr. Octopus, pictured here, who um, has no actual superpowers, but made himself a set of robotic arms, which uh, make him quite extraordinary in some ways. Black Panther uh, also uh, has a suit made out of, I um, uh, forget what the name of that, magic metal that they have is. Um, and so the basic idea of a gadgeteer, which is repeated quite a number of times in, in this kind of fantasy fiction, is that they derive their powers from machines, generally of their own construction. Now- Go, go, gadget! <laughs> what's that, Victoria? Go, go, gadget! What about- yeah. Well, gadget? yes, that's also true. A little uh, slightly silly one. Oh, here's one. gadget. Um, okay, so um, the a phenotype is a technical word. It means a set of observable characteristics of an individual resulting from the interaction of its genotype with the environment. Okay, so uh, I have brown hair. That's part of my phenotype. Okay, the extended phenotype, which was uh, the name of a book by Richard Dawkins, is the manifestation of genes that occur outside of the uh, environment outside of the organism itself that is in response to its genes. Okay. Um, so for example, the extended phenotype of a, a wasp is a wasp nest. And the extended phenotype of a honeybee includes the honeycomb, which is 99% um, a, a genetic uh, behavior um, probably not a learned behavior. So if we extend this to the gadgeteer, Iron Man's exoskeleton could be considered his extended phenotype. Now, Victoria Jacqua, who is, is on this call, has talked a lot about public infrastructure. So if you think about a whole city, the extended phenotype of human beings includes the sewage system and the roads. And now we would say the public infrastructure includes open source software. Um, but the, when we think about the gadgeteer, we're mostly talking about a private infrastructure. So Homo sapiens is tool using animal. Uh, if, even if we just consider clothing, a human without tools is not really a complete human. You're at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, uh, human beings require a spacesuit and a scuba tank and a parka to survive within certain uh, different environments. And so um, the, the things that are personal to our nature, which are personal objects, which are artifacts, which we manufacture are really extremely important. Um, uh, and, you know, for example, dolphins are very smart, but they don't wear clothes and uh, a, chimpanzee probably could make a hat and stick it on its head, but usually it doesn't. Now, 
um, things evolve in the far future world of Dune, which is uh, not depicted particularly well here. There's this idea of a still suit, which completely covers um, the wearer's body. Okay, not what you see in the movie and not what is depicted here. It covers every inch of skin except for the eyes and allows them to live in a environment with zero humidity and only lose a thimble full of water every day under those circumstances. That's kind of science fiction-y. Now, in Texas, before it became constitutional carry, there were 1 million out of 30 million Texans who had concealed handgun carry permits. This was in 2021. Now, presumably not all of those people were actually carrying a gun on any given day. And yet, um, to those people, they would consider that gun to be a very important sort of gadget uh, that's a part of what they're doing. Now, sadly, not as many people carry Narcan or first aid kits. Yet, 65% of Americans have taken a CPR class at some time in their life, but only 18% of them are um, up to date. So, um, most of the people who have done both of these things for different reasons are, are doing it to be a good person. They're doing it to be a hero. They're doing it to extend their power and to, to be able to help people. Uh, I personally might question their choices, but nonetheless, if you ask them, that's what they say they're doing. So we already have a kind of a canonical gadgeteer, uh, it's the soldier. And so a modern soldier has a complete kit of interacting devices, um, which are a part of what they do. But we can also think of a paramedic. A paramedic has a kit that they take with them, and it, it's part of what they do. And these gadgets are extremely important to them. Now, we wouldn't think of a paramedic as having superpowers, but of course, if they didn't have their paramedic kit with them, they'd be able to do a lot less than they could with it. Okay, we can also think more um, humorously, sort of, there's the idea of a survivor kit, where you have, you know, a shovel and um, a first aid kit and some gloves and a compass and a hatchet and, you know, tools that allow you to survive in a very rugged environment. Uh, one thing that, that I've done a lot is a lot of backpacking. And um, if you have a tent and a stove and a sleeping bag and some other equipment, you can survive for a pretty long time in a very harsh environment that you, you couldn't survive in uh, under other circumstances. Okay, and then finally, perhaps most humorously, there's the idea of a tourist. And a tourist um, has an essential feature, which is a smartphone. Right. But they also have the ability, they have sunscreen, you know, and they may have nutrition bars and a few other little things like hand wipes uh, that they keep in a fanny pack and maybe a tourist book and sunglasses. And so it it's funny. And yet, in a way, a, a well-prepared tourist is also a gadgeteer who is using a variety of things <clears throat> to extend not only their safety, but their comfort and their enjoyment um, in what they're doing. And of course, the, the smartphone is an extremely important part of that activity. Um, it's kind of the most important gadget in all of this. So gadgeteering in this sense is about personal empowerment. Now, lately I've been reading about cryptocurrency. There's a, 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 an, a group of people who call themselves green pill people uh, in opposition to red pill people. And they're trying to use cryptocurrency to provide personal empowerment to people by democratizing finance or decentralizing finance. And um, we can ask the question, can we give people a personal kit of equipment and gadgets that empowers them in a democratizing way? So we can think about clothes you know, uh, we, we, if we think from kind of a science fiction point of view, you know, what would we ultimately have? So 
if we had science fiction capability, we would have light clothing that would protect us from cold and heat and sunlight and infection, all of which are um, described by Ursula K. Le Guin in her 1960s novel, Rokanon's World, and dehydration, as in Dune. And you could have a wearable pack that would also contain other things, like a very powerful first aid kit, a tricorder from Star Trek, the original series, which is sort of a multi-purpose scientific instrument that lets you record all kinds of stuff. You your cell phone. Go ahead. Your cell phone. A cell phone. So a cell phone basically can store every map that you ever have had on Earth with you at all times, which in the in the past, people wrote science fiction stories about this and called it a map box, an electronic map box. But now we actually have it. And then you you would also like to have an ability to produce electricity personally. And so Iron Man has a, some kind of weird platinum nuclear power thing in his chest, which provides an enormous amount of power. But you can just have a very small solar panel. It won't provide an enormous amount of power, but it provides enough to charge your cell phone, for, for example. So you, in various science fiction situations, you an individual person can have a very small power generator that goes with them. So right now, there's plenty of wearable tech that's being designed. But unfortunately, a lot of it is being aimed at wealthy people who have what we might call the lifestyle diseases of the first world, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, atherosclerosis. We could instead ask, what could we do as humanitarian engineers? What could we build that would really be life-saving? Now, one idea that we have personally explored with Rice University, students at Rice University, is the idea of building a cool suit. And I don't mean fashionable in that sense. I mean a vest that would actually extract heat from your body to allow you to survive heat waves. Now, in the last five years, we've had terrible heat waves, believe it or not, in Canada, uh, here in the United States and in the northern United States, which is usually relatively cool. And of course, Europe has had a lot of heat waves, but there are certain places in the Middle East, like Qatar, for example, and um, the deserts in India and in Thailand, where it's possible for it to be extremely hot and extremely humid at the same time. Now, human beings are one of the few animals that can sweat. If we have enough water, we can survive very, very high temperatures if it's dry outside. But if it's also hot and also the humidity approaches 100 degree humidity, we can't survive because sweating becomes ineffective at cooling our bodies. This is expressed- wet bulb death temperature? Uh, well, it's called the wet bulb temperature, but uh, did you call it the death temperature? I mean, 100 degrees. Yeah. If the wet bulb temperature becomes 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees centigrade, human beings cannot survive without additional help, without additional shelter, cooling, dryness, or, or some other feature. Okay. Now, normally, the wet bulb temperature is much lower than the actual temperature. The wet bulb temperature is, is what you have if you have a ball of cotton that's moist and you put a thermometer inside it. By evaporation, it will normally be much cooler than the surrounding environment, but not if the relative humidity is extremely high. Okay. Now, I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. And in fact, this is going to be a re relatively short talk, but I believe we could make a personal coolant system powered by a small battery that uses a standard vapor compression cycle, just like the refrigerator you have in your house or an air conditioner. And we could use ethanol as a refrigerant, so we wouldn't have to use Freon in all of these systems. Um, and in that way, build a, um, uh, uh, a system that might head off a catastrophic heat event. Yes, Victoria. So for about two years now, I've had an idea to make exactly this 
which is a uh, not necessarily um, a soup, but it is a first layer that goes inside a firefighter's um, like the big jacket they wear. So before they put the big jacket on, either that shirt goes on or it's already attached inside that jacket. Because what's hap what happens is these guys obviously have this really heavy kit and they go to fight the fire and they get overheated and they have to switch out of the fire a lot because of the heat. So yes. I, was I was talking with a firefighter once about this and I said, well, what if you guys had like this internal layer in the jacket that could cool you? Would that help? And he said, yeah, someone needs to invent that. So we're yeah. thinking along the same lines. That's that right. That's not already a thing. I'm sorry? It's amazing that that's not already a thing. Well, so the reality is it... Um, I guess I'll enable this. The reality is that it's a very hard engineering problem. Okay, to make a small refrigeration unit like that would be very hard. And also, you have to calculate the um, the the energy consumption and the battery size would be uh, an, an issue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think I think it's something that the world definitely needs. The I first encountered this problem actually when I was working in in the White House. Uh, or with the Office of Science and Technology Policy during the last Ebola crisis uh, back in 2013. And the doctors who were treating Ebola, you know, have to be covered head to foot with, you know, personal protective equipment, essentially rubberized gear. And they were doing this in places where it was extremely hot. And they could use ice packs on their back sometimes, but that is a, a situation that only lasts so long and it has certain limitations, you know, and the, the doctors would get to the point where they were about to be overcome by heat and then they'd have to quit treating the patient, go somewhere, follow a very difficult protocol because of course you, you can't allow the outside of the suit to infect you, to take it off and change into a new suit. Uh, and so th this is something really that that should be addressed, and um, it's not impossible, but it is, from an engineering point of view, very difficult. Now, 10 years ago at a hackathon, I created this situational awareness hat. Uh, it would be a lot more stylish than the one that I'm model that I'm wearing there. But uh, what we did is we created something for women that had a motion detector on the back of the head. And if someone walked behind you, it just beeped. It didn't do anything else. It just let you know that someone was moving behind you. So when you, you were just sitting at a park bench reading or something, and someone came within range behind you, it just beeped. That's all it did. Um, but I, I think there are a lot of times that would be a very useful uh, invention for some women and would make them feel more comfortable um, being out in public. So you know, we can have a lot of ideas on things that we as public inventors could build that could really save lives. We could make an op opioid overdose protection wearable, uh, where if you had an overdose without having to have presence of mind, because presumably if you've injected yourself with heroin or you've taken fentanyl or something else, it's going to give you an overdose. You're not in a position to make good decisions but you could wear something that would detect this and just automatically inject you with Narcan and save your life in that way. We could make an integrated cool or warm suit. We could make an automated ventilator where you just put it on someone's face and it has enough intelligence to know if it needs to supplement their breathing. This, this is an idea that Dr. Eric Schultz of Australia has had. Uh, we could make an alcohol inebriation defense system that would work kind of the same way. We could make anti-crime uh, crime recording and reporting, just a wearable that took pictures around you so that if you were a victim of a crime, uh, it wouldn't prevent you being a victim, but it, it would make it difficult for someone to get away with having assaulted you and provide situational awareness in some other ways. 
Um, so the ultimate goals, these are my personal goals here, would be for every person and every family to have everything they need to survive, even if they're unhoused. You know, sadly, in the United States, we have a lot of people who uh, don't have homes, even though we're a, a wealthy nation. But we could at least give them what you might consider a basic level of gadgeteering kit necessary for them to have a somewhat comfortable life. All around the world right now, there are tens of thousands of refugees, and we could provide them modest security, even if we can't provide them uh, fixed shelters, if we gave them a basic kit that allowed them to be safe and relatively comfortable in those circumstances. And I don't think this would be exceptionally expensive. Now, I'm extending uh, the purpose of the talk here, but every child has what they need to learn K through 12. This has been expressed by other people in um, the movement called the Open Textbook Movement and also the One Laptop Per Child Movement. We could, at the same way, we could have every person have a free high quality courses to learn anything that you can learn in college. And we can give every person a very, very small amount of electrical power, just enough electrical power to recharge a cell phone. But the difference between having enough power to recharge a cell phone and not recharge a cell phone is the difference between life and death in some circumstances. So here is my suggestion. How can we make this real? We create a firm dedicated to humanitarian gadgeteering. We create open standards and invite the community to participate. We create an unbrand trademark for this firm. We allow other brands, that is manufacturing firms, to operate under our unbrand umbrella. And then we could probably sell these products as fun lifestyle statements and use the income to support truly life-saving gadgets. So for the unbrand, I suggest the name Hero Cape. So we could create a firm called Hero Cape and we could create our first product line. So our product line could include utility belts like Batman's old utility belt, situational awareness hats, first aid fashion. So um, it's uh, fashionable for women to carry these very small and um, completely impractical clutches, but you could sew an EpiPen into them, right? And you could sew Narcan right into them where you know you could be prepared for significant life-saving emergencies and very fashionable at the same time. You win, you made everyone laugh. Also, I, I find uh, down here, this model wearing this cape, uh, uh, dress. It could be a sort of a tearaway cape that could be used as an emergency blanket. This we could we could participate in high fashion and save lives by gadgeteering. Now, this is an advertisement for something. I call it the Hero Cape Auto Dock. Okay, Auto Dock is in automatic doctor. It's an AI-powered paramedic assistant that makes on-the-spot tests and diagnoses, turns every person into a portable clinic. This one is styled in the uh, original series from Star Trek uh, style, and you could buy one for only $535 from Hero Cape. Carry it with you, and you would be a, your own doctor. We could also create uni in a box, the idea of university in a box, AI-powered poly-language personal tutor, sternly enforces your daily learning goal to take you from basic penmanship through partial differential equations. Why watch a show on Netflix when you have uni in a box? It's $250,000 cheaper than a university education. For $999.99, you can have universal knowledge to anyone makes a great stocking stuffer. And then finally, our first hero cape products that we could really make is the Moonrat, our portable battery powered incubator. 
And I suggest we create a fashion line called the Brainiac One Independent Scientist line, modeled here by this young lady. Uh, and we make things for the intrepid explorer or scientist who wants to use um, our gadgets. And as part of that, because many of these gadgets require power, we need to create the Hero Cape power system, consisting of wearable solar uh, items and a small battery system with a smart microgrid to power your wearable accessories, which of which many will be coming from Hero Cape in the future. That ends my presentation. I think this is great fun. Thank you. I'll stop sharing until, unless somebody has a question about specific, specific slides and we can have a little bit of a conversation about it. Hello, Audrey. Hello, Naram. Thank you for coming. So I'm surprised I don't have any questions or uh, comments um, about this. You know, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. So one question I had was when you brought up the kit about being like a paramedic on the side, how would you do that? Because the thing with a lot of healthcare products or medical device products is there's a lot of regulations and standards that like AI powered stuff is limited with saying a diagnosis, right? Because we don't have good ways of taking those, the measurements, like maybe SPO2, but SPO2 relies on them being still, right? So a lot of readings and like measurements used to quantify diagnosis and take tests in like those terrains aren't very accurate. So there's like a high chance of like misreading or like misdiagnosis because the AI wasn't trained for like certain mix, like um, health conditions, right? Like if their pathophysiology is really complicated or for women, it presents this way, but for men, it presents this way. So like how, <laughs> what was the approach for that one? Because all of the other kids kind of was like, okay, I can see where this would go with it. But that one, I saw that to be the trickiest one, but maybe that's because of bias, right? As a biomed. Well, I mean, it's a really, it's a really good question. And it, it, it raises the whole can of worms as to how to how to answer this i mean the so the first answer is you just um separate you claim it's not making a diagnosis even though it really is right if you don't if you don't sell it for the intended purpose of making a diagnosis and you don't need fda approval okay now um Many disclaimers abound, right? Not financial advice, not for whatever, like don't, no guarantees, use it at your own risk, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. But, but the real answer is over time, you try to prove that it's good enough that it can get FDA approval. Okay. And that would not be an easy, easy task. That might take 10 years. It might take 10 years for, first of all, for it to be true. And then it might take another five years for you to convince the FDA that it's true. But, but you probably saved a lot of lives in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, say that again, Joe. You probably saved a lot of lives in the meantime. One, one may hope, right? And, you know, we wouldn't be in this, we wouldn't be in this together, right, uh, uh, alone, you know. I mean, if, for example, so I, believe it or not, the U.S. FDA ha it has been pretty reasonable. For example, they granted a nine-month emergency use authorization for ventilators during the pandemic because they thought it was going to save lives, okay? If, if paramedics tell them, this is saving lives, even though we would prefer professional paramedics be on hand. But if there's no paramedic there and you don't have any other way to do it, society will adapt to it. So I am not um, a rebel who says we should just try to skirt the FDA. I think we should work with the FDA as much as possible. But you're right. It would take 
many, many years. It wouldn't be a snap. I mean, so, our cell phones get pretty close to this already with some of the first aid apps. Um, yeah, I think if you were limiting yourself to first aid type things, you know, a lot of those pathways are not that complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's, you, you, you would be on firmer legal ground, at least in the United States, if you say something is only for first aid rather than for medical treatment. Right. Um, so in, in the United States, um, w there's a basic principle that um, if you're acting as a so-called good Samaritan, and you harm somebody, but your intention was to help them, that you are not subject to legal liability. So if a child is drowning and I jump in the water and try to save them and uh, the, and I fail to do so, and then someone says, well, you made it worse. You, you swimming out there, you bumped the child on the head and knocked it underwater and it died because of your action. The, the fact that I was attempting to save the child represents a, a, a legal defense in that case. That may not be true in other nations, but that's the way it works here. Hi, Audrey. Nice to see you after a while. Do we have any other any other questions? Is anyone interested in trying to create a gadgeteering product line? I mean, I'm kind of interested in that. Um, and the funny thing in the same vein, I wanted to do the same thing with the, the cooling vest, but I wanted to use a um, the uh, ammonia um, refrigerating cycle because that one could be used with um, a heat based source as opposed to a compressor com compression based um, um, source. Um, I, think that I also want to do. Um, I think the I think the I think the uh, the ventilator has a lot of applications in um, workplace safety. And I think we, we I talked I mentioned this previously, but um, the same thing that the same ventilator could also be used for uh, a personal, um, I don't know what they call it, a tapper. Um, and that would allow you to basically build the same hardware for both industrial applications and then repurpose it for medical emergencies, which I think has a lot of benefit because you'll have them on hand anyways. Well, that's right. I can't promise that the, my idea of using ethanol is better than using ammonia for the cool suit idea. That might work better. And, you know, you're you're right. There are lots of situations. I mean, it's, it's sad to say due to war and conflict, but also here in the United States, forest fires and industrial disasters. There are lots of situations where dozens of people can be under tremendous respiratory distress at the same time because of a fire or a bomb or a poison gas or some other kind of situation. If you had a smart device that wouldn't harm you if you were breathing consciously and your blood oxygen level was completely normal, then you know you could show up, there could be people lying on the ground, you're not sure what's wrong with it, you just put this on their mouth and it, the, the thing starts intelligently trying to provide service. Dr. Schultz, who really came up with this idea, you know, he points out that the automatic defibrillators, you know, were once uh, science fiction, but now they're safe and they're considered, you know, a pretty reasonable life-saving intervention. There's no reason that it couldn't be done in other ways. Now, as Megan has pointed out, it would require an enormous amount of research, way beyond what public invention could do to get FDA approval for the such a device but we could we could build one we could start it you know it's never been the intention of public invention to bring things to market per se but to create um designs which other people bring to market um well, that's, one, well, that's one reason why i was thinking about a commercial the commercial route because the commercial requirements for medical well devices that have a that could be used for medical purposes 
but aren't explicitly stated for medical purposes are much more lenient. It's the same reason why you can buy um, like medical grade syringes um, on Amazon that are not rated for medical use, but are used for arts and crafts, but they're the same physical thing. Okay, good, good point. Good point. Um, but, you know, uh, jokes aren't funny if they don't have a grain of truth in them, right? I mean, we really could create an unbrand, the, the idea of an umbrella under which we allow commercial firms to make gadgets that fit within the umbrella. And we really could create a standard, for example, for transmitting electrical power between gadgets, which are, um, you know, are part of the ecosystem, the, the hero cape e ecosystem, right? So you have a cap, a gimme cap that has a little bit of solar power, you know, you have to say, well, what's a connector to connect it to my cell phone or the other gadgets that are part of, part of my system? You know, you would like uh, to the firms that want to participate in this to not have to reinvent all of these things. Um, you know, another idea I've had is, you know, we could just create a standard set of enclosure shapes, you know, not unlike the cell phone, right? Like what if we had a dozen different enclosure shapes and you could, you know, put 10 different sensing ideas in one enclosure shape. And you wouldn't have to redesign the enclosure every time you you do it. You wouldn't even have to rebrand the enclosure. Yeah, um, and th these ideas have been floating around for quite a while. Um, so, and I and I, I thought about these too, and I've got some I've got some ideas of how to make these practical. Um, the, the real question is: there's what would be the uh, one? Is there enough to really like um, move on the idea? And like, do you think the current product lines that you have lined up are good enough to really? push the idea to see if it's how viable it would be. No, <laughs> absolutely not. This is, I mean, this is just a made up joke, right? My, the current product line that I've thought of is not, is not good enough, but you know, it's a start. Maybe you guys could expand it or maybe someone will, will listen to this talk on YouTube and say, ah, well, I, I think I could do that. And, and then it will become a reality. I mean, I, I would be surprised. I've, I've been I've been pleasantly surprised by the the amount of products that have I thought would never be commercially viable, but apparently have found a niche. Um, I, I watched a company that makes open fully open source keyboard and mice peripherals uh, for trackballs and like the, the really good crunchy like really giant uh, like globe sized trackballs that you used to see in the eighties and nineties. Like they're mm -hmm. making those open source. Um, which I find delightful as a as a concept. Um, so I have I I would I would not sell the idea short if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, because I think the market may be out there. Well, you know, public invention has done a lot of highbrow things, but we haven't done anything that really appeals to a consumer. So I would kind of like to make something for a consumer, even if it's a little on the fun side more than on the useful side, you know? Um, so that's an idea. Hey guys. Hi, um, Audrey. Just... Hi, how you doing? Good. Okay, I moved my car, so I think I have better service now. Um, I just wanted to say, and I had dropped like something in the chat um, about the, you had mentioned like Narcan and I'm not a, an engineer at all. So this is just an idea for me, but I lived in um, Asheville, North Carolina and now I'm back in Huntsville and like the opioid crisis and like, like fentanyl overdoses are like both like astronomical here. So as someone that like is very passionate about both of those things and I'm in an area where those things are highly affected, I think that um, creating a sort of device like you were talking about that like can either tell you like, hey, not good or 
um, you were talking about like injecting whenever someone maybe be overdosing. Um, I think those would both be huge things. And I'm also interested in like coming back on and like the marketing aspect. So um, I just wanted to say like, I'm in an area where that's an acute, like a huge issue. So that would be something that I would be definitely like very interested and passionate about seeing because there's, there's just so many overdoses every day, like in my area. So. Well, maybe someone uh, who sees this on YouTube will email us about it and we'll get enough energy to make it. I, I don't feel like public invention by itself without more volunteers right now could undertake that because I know, I know so little about it. But I do believe it is a it is a very pressing need. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there who want to be a hero. And so they go take a concealed handgun course or something and they learn to carry a gun because they someday want to be a hero. And you're more likely to save somebody's life if you just keep Narcan on your person. OK, but I don't I don't carry a first aid kit every time I walk out the door. I don't, you know, I don't carry Narcan with me every time I leave the house. If someone made it fashionable, maybe I would, right? If if someone made a wallet-sized Narcan, Narcan thing, maybe I would just have it in my, I would literally, it'd be in my wallet all the time. And maybe women could have it in their purse all the time because it's somehow, you know, so sewed in there. Right. So with with almost all inventions, there's a technical side, but there's also a social and human side. Right. How do you get people to actually use the thing? And maybe, Audrey, you can help, especially if some if we get some volunteers who, you know, are willing to move forward with that idea. Isn't the issue like actually obtaining the Narcan? Isn't it like a question of supply of that? And who gets to administer it that's the problem? Not so much being able to carry it? No, no I think, it's I definitely think you just... not. I was just going to say, like, um, I had worked at, like, a rehab for a couple of months, and they would give it to anyone that was, like, in there, basically, just to, you know, they want to save your life, you know? So it's, I don't think it's a supply issue as much as it is, like, a, probably more of a lack of understanding of why you would have it, but I don't think it's a supply issue. Yeah, I, th I think that's correct. I have a hefty understanding of like the, the addicts and all that stuff, but um, I, this is speaking to me because I have a, I'm glad I came I was able to come to this meeting tonight because I, uh, I think this is very important and um, I do think there's a lot we could do with that. Okay, well, let's take action on it. Um, Naram, Anil, we haven't heard from you. Do you guys have anything to say? Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks again uh, for being here for hosting Rob. Uh, we're hosting this uh, online uh, forum, um, but yeah, I to be honest, I'm just uh, listening in. I think there's some good ideas here. I'm kind of I, I don't have any experience with you know uh, fentanyl or any um, drugs, and what the you know one thing I would suggest is like you know if you uh, I'm sorry I forgot the lady's name that was on the chat here, but um, if you have experience with understanding like the problems and the challenges with um somebody that you know um takes it like you know that's the first step is like really to in before you can um come up with a solution or a proposed idea a solution potential solution really understanding like the pain and the challenge and the problems that an individual would face that would you know what are the steps that you know, they would take to, you know, engage in this process and, you know, how can you prevent that then, right? But really like hashing out like how, what is the extent of the problem? What is the problem? And and is that the correct problem that you're addressing there, right? Like is half of the battle of trying to come up with something that's 
a good solution and then also uh, a, an opportunity to innovate in against other uh, solutions that are out there. Um, but yeah, that's just my two cents there. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, um, uh, many people like myself enjoy making things. And so they're highly sort of technical, but you have to be more than technical. You have to have good human expertise. And it's when you put the two together that that happens. And that's why public invention needs volunteers who are graphic artists, writers, user experience experts, and people who can solve the kind of problems that you were just talking about, Anil, um, in, a, in addition to solving you know, technical problems. Although when, I mean, when it comes to Narcan, it's, it's, well, there, there are different ways to solve the problem. I, I noticed Nar, Naram here says in the chat that she's interested um, in talking about it. I meet with Naram uh, every week, so I'll talk to you about it and maybe we can email Audrey. Um, Audrey, can you make sure I have your most recent email address if it's changed at all? Yeah, you do. You definitely do. And I want to say, um, sorry, I'm not sure the last person that spoke, but I was just going to say that on like the like dealing with the preliminary issues, it's also something um, that we could possibly focus on would be like the harm prevention aspect of it, which would be like the testing of like products that people are using which there are some things out there now, but they're not just very like, they're not very like prevalent or well-known of, uh, if that makes sense. Like there's not a lot of like testing done and yeah. then people are using yeah. things that they don't know what they're using. Well, so so it, are you, Audrey, are you saying that there's not enough text testing kits to cover the diverse materials that is laced with fentanyl? Because yes, even yeah. weed is being laced with fentanyl now. Yeah, absolutely. Like, because also, like, there's also testing, which I learned this recently, of, like, describe, like, fentanyl, it, like, in something is, like, a chocolate chip cookie. You can test yes. part of the cookie, and there's no chocolate in it, but yeah. then there are parts that have chocolate in it. So, like, there's not, like, a well-rounded testing of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, any any discussions we have around this topic, we need to bring Cody in on. Rob, because he's working with UT very closely on their Narcan distribution program. Yeah, um, yeah. He, he he's very he's very important. One of the busiest people in the world, but it needs to be part of this conversation. Yeah, um, um, Cody's a paramedic yeah. here in Austin that I, I had lunch with. Uh, he's trying I to get. To say, yeah, go ahead. Just that I thought that the concept of Wonder Woman's clutch that sort of unfolds into this rescue package, or or Clark Clint's uh, Clark Clint, Clark, Clark, Clint ah, Superman's uh, pocket protector, right? I think those are really very fun ideas, and and what you can put into those becomes really amusing, um, and potentially life saving. So Robert, I think those ideas are really good and I like the, the story it tells. Okay, well, so why don't we uh, end here? I'd like to end with just saying two things that relate to what Audrey was saying and, and this, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, think globally, act locally. And uh, he was talking about the physical globe of the earth when he said that, but if what we could take that to mean is think about the whole problem. As Audrey said, you got to think about the whole problem, the testing, the treatment, different aspects of the problem, and then, you know, solve one particular piece of the problem, but have the whole problem uh, in view. Um, so I am going to connect Cody, Naram, Audrey, and Victoria by email to see if we can take any action on this. Thank you, everybody, for um, joining. Uh, feel free to email me at 
read.robert at gmail.com. That's my last name, read.robert at gmail.com. And tell your friends, we'd like to have more people come. We'll be seeing you next month in March. We do this on the third Thursday of every month. I am not sure what the subject will be for next month, but it will be something. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop recording now.